So, so I, I'm joining here from the C CCP interface module. And uh, we are working on, on a number of ecological projects, also using global data. The origin of this presentation came from the fact that I asked Sandy, or I proposed to her a number of topics, and she picked up this one as being perhaps most interesting for this community. So I, I gave myself two goals, and it's not maybe our frontline research, uh, but I, I want to uh, achieve two things today. One is to give you a little bit of an overview of what kind of role the data sets most of us are using. You are probably as well. Uh, and then I want to show you two particular projects that we work on the global data sets in more detail. I prefer that to them covering a large uh, area of projects with, with not much detail. So we, if we think, uh, you know, in, in just in general terms, what global data sets for environmental research are used for and what they really are, we would have to say that they are data sets that have global coverage. Uh, their space or space time data, they have rather coarse footprints in space. So, uh, but they have reasonably high time resolutions. Um, and they are obtained by different methods. And here I stress that. So if I would uh, ask you in the room, uh, how many of you feel like you have been using global data sets? Please raise your hand. At least it looks like half of you. So I ask the same people, are you sure you know exactly how that data was obtained? Maybe you're just playing along. Okay, good. So you do, right? So that's what users should be doing. And what are the origins? Uh, I would like to make the distinction between remote sensing derived data sets, real analysis derived data sets, and machine learning derived data sets. And uh, I would make the point uh, that remote sensing or a, a summary are really passive active sensors, multi spectral band combinations. Real analysis is a new kind of way of using climate data sets that use some observations and remote sensing, but together with some physically based modeling to arrive at uh, the climate set. And machine learning are data driven methods as we know that have many covariates. So let's look at some examples. DEMs, you've all been using DEMs, uh, usually derived by remote sensing, most commonly by synthetic aperture radar, SAR type data sets. This is Everest or the Rose uh, Glacier, SRT and Aster pandemics, globally about 30 to 90 meter resolutions. Uh, of course, regionally, we can have much higher spatial resolutions. Uh, land surface data. So here we're talking about remote sensing, usually optical from satellite. Land cover, vegetation, the Landsat, very commonly used. You've probably done that yourself. Uh, very commonly uh, conducted analysis is changes in land cover in time, like you see in the image on the right, 92 to 215 Singapore uh, land cover change. But there are also vector data sets like building footprints and nightlight data, which we will use today as well. Then there are what I would call surface indexes. So usually remote sensing, but now multispectral, things like vegetation and EDI, things like um, um, the fraction of absorbed photosynthetically active radiation, land degradation indexes, urban surfaces, global urban footprint resolution that is here dependent on the spectral bands. Not every satellite has the same resolution of the bands, spectral bands. Sentinel, I just put as a keyword there, is one of the very common we use satellite data um, with very high resolution today. Uh, and you see here again NDVI vegetation index over parts of Singapore with green vegetation in red and not so green vegetation in lighter colors. You also recognize problems, yeah, yeah, right? and that is class. So we have a problem with building deficits of this kind. Then comes climate. Climate can be, of course, obtained with remote sensing methods. But I think myself and colleagues, I observe that in the, in the community as well, we often prefer to use climate reanalysis data sets recently. And, and so these combine some climate models with remote sensing or observations. They're 
interesting because they provide consistent interrelated climate variables, so not independent uh, climate variables. The two most common data set types that are out there used for hydrology are META from the US and ERA5 uh, coming from Europe. Um, and the spatial resolution here can be down to 10 kilometers hourly time. So this becomes interesting for actually feeding into hydrological models. Climate change, why not? Variables, climate change as well. Remember now, all these IPCC and climate modeling to comparison projects are available in a spatial context. So you have these types of platforms popping up almost every day where you can click on any point in the globe and find out what is the climate change projection there. What about the machine learning uh, methods? Here we're talking about soil data, for instance. So soil grids is a data set, 250 meter resolution with soil properties, um, uh, soil texture, phys soil physics, chemistry, pH, soil organic carbon in six steps uh, over the entire globe, right? Uh, this can be very interesting for applications where you don't have local data. Another one is stream flow, mean annual stream flow on a one kilometer grid called uh, Flow 1K. And here I just picked a picture from Barbarossa's paper of this uh, data set where, where, you, where the stress here is that these are data derived um, uh, assessments. So uh, you, you have a DEM, then you have different covariate layers, climate, you pick a neural network type of model. Uh, which you combine with observations and you train this data model to give you grids of annual uh, runoff um, and also maximum minimum runoff. So we have to be aware that these are already model, model outputs. So why do we use global data sets to continue in this thought? Well, because ground climate stations often are very sparse. They represent a very small area. Interpolation in space is needed. That's an extension there near our home. And we usually ask ourselves questions like, do we need a point or area? Do we just need one point or do we need an area? How important is accuracy? Is the time resolution record period actually important? Sometimes we have short periods of observations, but these global climate data sets have decades of data available for our location. Can we use this? So the answers often in this case go in the favor of global data sets. That's why I would encourage you not to be afraid of using them. And the key argument, as you see down there, is that the global data sets are useful in particular for solving problems where we don't have grounding, so these ungaged regions. So that's kind of the motivations. How good are global data sets generally? This is not really an objective analysis. So I tried to put together the ones I had on my previous slides and, and say here, uh, you know, are they good? The cross, uh, blue cross, red cross, not so good, and circle, so, so. And you will see remote sensing, reanalysis, machine learning, also question marks. This is my matrix. You would create your own. Uh, Everybody should actually, if you try more of these. What I would like to maybe highlight here is that soil, soil moisture and soil data are usually trouble, trouble for us, very poorly um, still derived from remote sensing, I found for hydrological purposes. Uh, and then we have some trouble with climate uh, variables like precipitation, which from satellites are not so easy to observe. There are question marks because some data sets are, and methods are still under research uh, at the moment. One last thing on the introduction is that these global data sets, remember, should often in every application be calibrated to ground climate. So for instance, this is a study I'll show you later. We picked one of these reanalysis data sets, ERA-5 temperature, and we used it in Ethiopia. Well, what you would do is like try to match it to observations on the ground. That's uh, observations at Addis Ababa um, on the ground. And this is our, our global data set, which was quantile mapped uh, and therefore bias controlled to give us at this point what we want to do. Right? And of course, you can do that globally. This is what normally is being done. So 
very rarely you actually take the role of global that a statistical with regard to climate and apply them. And, or if you do, don't expect uh, outstanding results. For machine learning data, even more so, these, their ground observations are used in the training of the methods. So they, by definition, have the need to learn from observations. And I will make the final comment here that at a location where you have ground measurements, they use those and trust those more than a global, global grid estimate at that point. But of course, you still can compare them. So let's look now at two examples. And so I want to present this use of global data sets on two examples. One is looking at electrification potential in ungaged areas so of the entire country of Ghana, work done by a master student in our group, Flavia. And then the second um, topic will be to look at the vulnerability of rain-fed agriculture in Ethiopia by PhD student Mosisa Chira, who's seen the room and is watching the presentation too. And then I'll have a slide at the end uh, connecting to the C module. Yohan Vadoy, which is sitting here in the middle, um, is a PhD student working on this project. Here for the next two weeks, still. Remember, the main pur purpose of this type of analysis is to provide what I call a first order analysis. So, this is like where you're starting, you don't know much, apply these global data sets to find out first order what's going on. And if this remains interesting, a uh, detailed study should follow with uh, you know, more detail. So let's look at the first topic, hydropower potential. So here, what I just want to remind you, probably many of you know, hydropower potential is really computed as a function of the head and discharge in the river. If you're looking at the image on the right, we're looking at hydropower potential of small hydropower plants. So we're not building huge dams, we're just diverting water from the river using the head to generate power with the discharge. Very cheap, speaking, compared to building dams, very effective way of generating electricity. Uh, we also need to then compute annual electricity production or can compute uh, simply by integrating over time. Right? So how many watts, what hours in a year can you produce with this type of... Uh, uh, also remember that small hydropower, this is a flexible definition, but small hydropower normally is less than about one megawatt hour. In this talk, I will even use half a megawatt power, uh, and, but this varies from country to country. In Switzerland, for instance, we call small hydropower even smaller plants than that. So what are the questions we can pose here of a global data set? We can ask things, and this is important to frame the questions well. So, what is the annual hydropower potential and electricity production potential in Ghana if across all the rivers they have? And where does supply meet electricity demand? This is the second question. In which river reaches is this development of small hydropower possible? The ingredients. We're going to use a global DEM. We're going to use this global mean annual uh, runoff data set. We'll use uh, day night band composite from satellite for identifying settlements. Uh, we'll use lab covered Copernicus data sets. These are the ingredients seen in our dish. We'll also use in italics the global runoff data center data set to verify whether the observations. The discharge produced by the flora K are correct or not going to be shown. So, so how does this work, or how does what does this end in? You go through these work steps. I'm not going to talk about the work steps, but what you will end up with is a map like this of the power potential in megawatts uh, across all the river segments in Ghana. You see Lake Volta there in the south uh, east corner of the country. You also can, can look at the power, annual power production and megawatt hours per year. And you can already see, you know, which river reaches are more attractive than others, right? Um, this is okay. Let's put this, these numbers a bit in perspective. Ghana consumed 19.7 terawatt 
hours of electricity every 21. Uh, and it's peak demand. So like all appliances turned on at the same time was about 3000 megawatts. Singapore in that same year consumed 53.5 terawatt hours of electricity. So three times more. Um, and the peak demand is only double that of now, which is kind of interesting. Remember, Singapore is six times smaller than Ghana, so we're talking about 20 times more energy use, electricity use in Singapore than in Ghana. Right? So, perfect. So, that's kind of a big difference. But this is not the kinds of numbers we should be aiming to track with uh, or to solve or address with small hydropower, right? We have to remember here. We as one runoff river hydropower plant can maybe cover one percent of the peak power. We're not going to solve the problem of countrywide hydropower with, uh, with small hydropower. But the aim of small hydropower systems is to electrify remote areas of the transmission grid. This is what I want to stress. Now. So this is one part of the answer. This has there has to be a second one. Where is the demand? So let's go to our global deficits, ask them, where is the demand? We thought about this with Flavia. What do we do now? Well, well let's find out first where, where people have electricity. So we take these day-night uh, radiance images. You see very clearly here, Accra, Kumasi, these are all cities that are in Lipat, very bright. But you see all over Ghana, of course, other settlements that have light. This is a very high resolution image behind this. And we ask ourselves then, uh, where is actually the, the, the radiance high and where is it low? And that's the green and the, and the pink pictures here. And why is that? Because low radiance settlements are considered lit up, but probably by uh, some small, uh, some small uh, power generators that people have or their burn pathing. Uh, they're not using electricity from the grid, right? So what we can do is divide all the settlements into the pink and the green ones. And the ones we really want to electrify with the small hydropower are the pink ones. And we haven't used any ground data. We're just looking with global data sets and what's coming. So due to this point, that's okay, and we need to check whether this transmission story works out. So Flavia went through the effort of identifying find where are transmission lines in Ghana uh, of different kilovolt uh, grids. You see here the kilovolts and different thickness of lines. And then she took the, made the effort to go through Google Earth and try to see these and see if they are actually functional. And there you see it's like where the problems begin. So point number six, for instance, was off the grid. You see it here. There was no grid map there, but there clearly is an electric line there. Point number one, which was on one of the high kilovolt grids, it is, but you probably see the wires hanging off the pole. So it's, it's in this repair, in this repair is not being used. So now we can try to put these two things together. We're going to ask the question of uh, where are the non-electrified the peak settlements within a buffer from half 500 meters to
Sorry, the Zoom people can't hear anymore since last slide. Try to still see more of the block in the FB. Just go. I unmute to make it so. so uh, unmute yourself and uh, uh, can I use your laptop yes. as a mic? Yeah. Did you say something? So can you hear me now here? Yes. Uh, yes, she said yes. Darcy said yes. Yeah. So uh, I'm sorry for inconvenient. So, so let's restart. Yeah, yeah, let's we'll start again. Okay, that should be fine. Thank you. Yeah, let me just start here. I'm sorry if you if you missed some um some some of the part. So I'll go, I'll go very fast here. I think uh, Mosisa, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, Rainfed agriculture was the second kind of application of a global data set. Uh, here, I would like to stress that 80% of agriculture globally is rainfed. Uh, we have to be aware of that, uh, not irrigated. Climate change is already having significant impacts on that. You have losses you see in the red colors of the of the crop yields between um, industrial times to today. And uh, what's also changing is the location of suitable production sites for our food. So here is an interesting way to look at that. Uh, this is the overlap between the right temperatures for maize, growing maize in Africa, uh, between the historical period and 25. So today in mid century and end of century, and you see, the overlap is practically going to zero. So this doesn't mean that you cannot grow maize, but you'll have to grow it at a completely different temperature regime uh, with consequences on yields. So let's look at Ethiopia here. Ethiopia is one of those countries. 95% of the area is rain-fed agriculture. The question we are asking here is how high is the cereal production um, loss due to a delay in the start of the rainy season? And then, the second question, how will the agroecological suitability for key cereals change in the future time? Again, ingredients global of global data, we are not using ground stations here much, some a bit for bias control. We'll have DM land cover like before, chirps, precipitation, very widely used in Africa, era five land, temperature. Remember, this is one of those reanalysis climate data sets, soil properties from soil grids. We have crop yield from from ground observations of crop yield in, in Ethiopia. And we, we have 21 uh, climate models giving us projections for a future climate in Ethiopia. These rainfall data sets, global rainfall data sets can be used to, um, to identify what is the rainfall regime, you know, and in Ethiopia, then you can see you have these areas that have unimodal rainfall regimes, and then areas southeast that have these bimodal rainfall regimes. And then you can identify when is the beginning of the rainy season and the end in every year. And you can try to relate that to what was the crop yield in that year or the crop yield anomaly. So how different was that year from the average? 
And this is what you can put together in correlations like this. So here you would have uh, the anomaly in crop yield. Zero would be no anomaly. Um, positive would be higher yield than uh, normal year, average year. And here would be the onset of the rainy season delay. So zero would be no, no delay. Uh, positive numbers on the right would mean there was a late, the rainy season started later. Uh, negative started earlier and you see a very strong negative correlation here. There is a clear, this is rain fed farming, right? The farmers wait for the rain to come. If it comes late, their crop yield that year will be low. Uh, and we can study this across the country. And on the average, it doesn't seem like a, lot, a large loss, one to 2% on the average for every five days delay. But if you look at this in some regions, it can go up to six to 8%. So it becomes important. You can also look at this thing called agroecological suitability. So every uh, type of crop here, we're looking at four cereals, teff, maize, wheat, sorghum, uh, has an optimal space where it has the highest crop yields. And those are, that's what these lines are meant to represent with regard to rainfall on the left, with regard to soil pH on the right. And you can derive these curves for any type of driving condition. And then you can ask yourself, well, what is the suitability if I combine all of these together? You may have a suitability given by the rainfall, by the temperature of a certain place, and then by the soil properties, uh, pH, soil organic carbon, and soil texture, sand to clay ratio. And you can compute this from the global data sets, the suitability, you get maps like that, uh, suitable green, not suitable red for every one of the crops. And then you can ask yourself, how will this change in the future, right? Because in some places, the uh, rainfall maybe will be more in Ethiopia. There are parts of Ethiopia where rainfall will actually increase in the future. Uh, and so you, you are going to look at where you are on this curve, if you are in a location where maybe for TEF you have not enough rain, now you have more, your suitability will go up. If you are already here somewhere and you have more rain, your suitability will go down because these plants don't, these crops don't grow in soil, wetted soil log, water log conditions. So you can create maps like this of changes in suitability. Red means worse, blue means better. Uh, into the future. And here, like in these maps, you see you would have um, mid, uh, so basically now mid century, end of century, and in the uh, rows, you have the different um, emission scenarios. Consequences there will be areas of decreases in suitability. Farmers can then think, well, how do I adapt to this? Do I have to abandon farming or switch crops? But you'll also have areas that will have an increase in suitability uh, where uh, this is just for TEF. You can do it for any other crop um, where maybe they can extend farming there, right? TEF is the cereal that is used widely in Ethiopian food for you have Ethiopian restaurants in Singapore when they make the injera pancakes, that's made from TEF. So this is this climate change is very important that it can, it can then be affect and it can be partitioned into what is temperature, what is the role of temperature, what is the role of rainfall. Here, um, I don't want to explain how, but the temperature sensitive parts of the country are red and the rainfall sensitive are blue. And so you, as a farmer now, you could, or an extension worker informing farmers, you have a, an ability to advise them on, on the risks that they are likely to experience in the future. What are those implications? You can plant at higher altitudes, you can develop field water storage, like this bonding that the uh, people are, are doing below, or change crops. You can also, of course, use insurance as an adaptive measure and so on. My last element, just two slides. I want to give you a flavor of how we're using global data sets for the coastal city problem with Yovan. Um, again, a motivation, remember low elevation coastal zone, less than 10 meters above sea level is only about 2% of the earth's surface, but 13% of the global population. 
up to 400 million people live in this area and, and many mega cities like Singapore are in that area. So there is a price to pay for that in an exposure to natural hazards. So Jovan is looking at all of these things at hydroclimatic vulnerability, at the kind of urban microclimatic vulnerability, at biodiversity or ecosystem vulnerability. Of course, mean sea level change, shoreline vulnerability, and, and all of this has to be seen in the context of socioeconomic uh, strength of a city so that uh, you can adapt, right? And we would like to have a big picture view on, on how coastal tropical cities actually can deal with climate change. Here, global data sets, just one example, are of course very useful to derive maps of the sea level rise projections. I imagine many of you have seen um, this these types of projections. Uh, Singapore is not so much at risk. Uh, this is an, a pathway, uh, this is a current emission pathway, I think 10% exceedance probability in 2050. Um, Singapore on the left, maybe not so much at risk, but if you go to places like Mumbai, you have dramatic uh, the losses of land uh, by sea level rise. So very important here. So my last two slides then cover what are risks involved with the use of global data sets. I divide them in four groups. One is, of course, that the accuracy is generally lower than ground measurements, or it is unknown, which is sometimes worse than when an accuracy is low, if you don't know how high it is or low it is. That Uncertainties are often underreported, so we don't know what is the uncertainty in some of the global data sets. Then there's a question of time. Um, there's a non-stationarity often inherent in, in time-dependent data sets uh, because, uh, for instance, they use stations for calibrating these global data sets and the number of stations in the early part of the century was nothing compared to what it is today, right? Or vice versa. So this kind of time non-stationarities are problematic and that's why we should always be very careful to use these global data sets for kind of trend analysis, the descriptions of change in time. And there's a time inconsistency. Not all global data sets have covered the same periods, et cetera. They're often not good for local extremes, I would argue. So if you look at, if you want to pull like annual or you know, some sort of statistics of heavy rainfall from a global data set, I, I would not trust that number too much. They should always be checked against local ground data in that sense. And sometimes, very important, they're not really independent of each other. This is where you should read the small print below because for instance, Flow 1K is derived using the DEM uh, and the precipitation from chirps. So if you then compare chirps rain and the Flow 1K data set, of course they'll agree because the Flow 1K uses it to derive the annual runoff total. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. And I'll end just with some take home messages to say, use global data sets. Don't be afraid of them, but use them wisely. Know their origin, pay attention to the origin. Are they purely remotely sensed? Are they reanalyzed like the climate reanalysis data sets? Are they machine learning um, elaborates? Compare more of them if you have, precipitation is a good example. If you, there are tons of precipitation global data sets out there, if you have the time, compare more to see which one is better for your region because that will vary regionally. Uh, do not trust too much their point grid values. There I would trust the ground data more, but for the spatial analysis like in Ghana, Ethiopia, I think they're more than adequate. Um, be careful with this detection of change in time and check for plausibility. Sometimes you get nonsensical values, check again. If they're nonsensical, then just better to kick that uh, data set out. So my message is global. Data sets can provide a first order analysis and engage large areas, like in the two examples I showed you and many others. There are many studies that do this nowadays. I find with sufficient accuracy, but they should be followed up with more local studies if you 
if you have the time in your project uh, to go in that direction. And I will stop there. Thank you, Professor Molna, for your great presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, does anyone have questions? Yeah, or it is a report. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for a very uh, good presentation. Uh, I cannot not art methods. Um, and I must, I just want to say that I feel really basically for take home messages. So we were a lot of things to recognize a lot of the top. Um, my question, or maybe the uh, like up, up to which level can you use this club and when we need to switch oh, instead of having uh, we have to or how that maybe in some kind of framework developed for the community deciding whether uh, the quality of the global is sufficient for their application is well. But what your view on that? Wow, that's a difficult question. <laughs> No, I have to be honest with you. I, it's a question I have not asked myself. It's an obvious question, of course, because uh, it kind of follows from these paper messages. I don't know. I mean, I think it always, if you, if you work in a very well-gauged place, uh, it, it also gives you the opportunity to then maybe replace those good data with like a global data set and see what happens how everything degrades, how everything falls down or not. So, so there, those could be like good places to check this concept, but uh, to work the other way around, whether there's a simple way to say, you know, I don't, you know, may, maybe a good example was this, um, I don't know if I can, if I can go back to this, because we had a discussion about this, this one here. So, uh, we showed to our Ghanaian, Ghanaian colleagues these types of maps, and they they like this very much. They can recognize the rivers where the government is planning hydropower projects. But then they ask, well, but there's there's much more that uh, needs to flow in here if you really want to use these types of maps for like government level planning, putting money on the table. And so I, I think there has to be a point where you look at this type of map and you and you say, well, there's got to be a reason why, why here maybe yes and here maybe no. And those things, the answers, if you cannot find the answers to those questions from these global data sets, then you've reached a limit and you need to you need to start looking in more detail locally, you know. So what is a, is it a question of? material supply chains, roads, uh, is it a case that people are simply not willing to pay for electricity there because they, they don't have the means, you know, those types of things you will not learn from global data sets, obviously. That's probably not a good answer to your question, but... Uh, uh, I, I think it's, it's, it points to, I think, something that I also agree with is that it's very important to involve uh, local stakeholders, yeah. local experts, and I think that would be a very valuable source of information, which may be not quantitative, but qualitative, yeah. which can be a very way to sort of blend in with this global data set, which I think is a very important thing to do in the end. And in fact, here, the, the, the point here with the numbers is also very useful to show to decision makers with these small hydropower plants, you will not solve the problem of your country's electricity supply, but you can help this region, that region develop uh, better because there it would make sense. So are there any other questions? So from my side, I'd like to ask you that uh, as long as my understanding, the uh, remote sensing is prerequisite for uh, supplementation, supplement or uh, calibration for the uh, reanalysis or machine learning, because uh, you cannot generate that data set from scratch. So yeah. I think the basement data set is required. So I think that is the 
um, remote sensing or observation, but are according to your slide number 11, just show me that. So yes, soil data are uh, regarding soil data, remote sensing is not so good. Or uh, instead of that, um, our the machine learning is very good. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm it's it's a little bit uh, surprising to me because uh, how how do you generate the soil data yeah. using the machine learning? Yeah. So this I knew I would get in trouble <laughs> for this for this thing. So, but anyway, the point. So here, when I put the Red Cross was really, I'm thinking of soil moisture there because there's a big effort to get soil moisture estimates from satellite and they see the moisture in the top five, 10 centimeters maximum. The footprints are huge and actually the data, I don't know if our colleagues from Delta Res have used those probably. Often the data are really poor that come from these satellites. So that's what I meant with the Red Cross. The machine learning methods like to to get to uh, oops, so something like this. Uh, the the machine learning algorithms, for instance, for soil texture, so uh, sand, silt, clay fractions, they take tens of thousands of soil cores around the world. Uh, where you actually measure these soil textural properties at different depths. And they train a, a machine learning model like this uh, artificial neural network, this regression model that's in there for discharge. They do the same thing for all these soil properties where the covariates think about what they would be. Same type of thing. What determines soil formation? It's climate, how much rain there is, what is the mean temperature, what is the typical vegetation, what is the elevation? All of these are covariates in this huge model, and that's how you get these uh, spatial maps like you see on the right there um, of, for instance, bulk density. And I mean, those of you that are into soil sciences will probably recognize things here, right? So the blue colors are high soil density, uh, light colors are lower. This is the surface. They are you can see this very, very kind of uh, porous, organic matter filled soil in the tropics, right? The tropical band. And you see the denser soils or, or sand in the Sahara and the Southern, uh, Southern Africa. So like this is coming from the data. So it's, it's probably correct. Would I trust the single place where your field is? Uh, probably not, but it's often better than, than just guessing what kind of soil you have. Right? There are alternatives to this. Of course, the FAO has its own soil map, which is not bad, but I want to use this as an example of, um, of sort of a machine learning derived data set. Uh, maybe because uh, we use soil bits also a lot, what we see indeed is that in regions where the data has been trained with a lot of local uh, samples, uh, the, 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 the data set is typically better. And what I find is that actually how this data was used, how many samples were used in this region. And I think that could be also maybe that's or a question state of why why is it that patients that are then and the quality of the yeah. location okay. so that's uh, that, that's I think something for the data quite for the research yeah. to keep reflecting back to the data informed about how much data is used gone that's a very good point indeed but it's super useful what I but you know, as like you, you you just said, it also gives us a false sense of wealth, data wealth. Oh, I have now bulk density at six depths anywhere. Yeah. You, those are all estimates from a model. You don't have that data with 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 super high confidence. On the data set, you also see the locations of actually all the all the soil soil sample soil. Um, so probes, I'm losing the right word that's used uh, for that. The soil profiles, 
So you can actually click on the soil profiles, those that are public, and find out what the actual measured values were at the given point. But indeed, this is probably one of the most widely used soil data set in hydrological studies that I'm familiar with uh, in the last maybe decade or so. If there are no other questions, sorry for uh, <laughs> but we're here to see of course so it's a question. How, how much of this load data that this is also being used here in Singapore and do you see also a use case for the load data sets in Singapore for itself? I don't know who I have to ask this question <laughs> since we're here in Singapore. Well, 